great. Thank you, Dave. Um, well, Corinne is a powerful and tireless uh, advocate for the rights of BC's nurses and residents. And for some three years now, she has been working on behalf of the thousands of nurses in BC who were unlawfully terminated after refusing mandated injections of the mRNA COVID-19 genetic vaccines. And these are truly labors of Hercules, uh, both enormously difficult and surprisingly thankless. In addition to these labors undertaken on behalf of British Columbians with respect to our healthcare system, Corinne is involved in a number of other vital advocacy projects at the municipal level uh, related to the regional district of Central Kootenai and which fall outside of the parameters of today's discussion. And if all of this weren't overwhelming enough, she is simultaneously running as an independent candidate for the Central Kootenai riding in the upcoming provincial election. I'm very happy that Corinne has agreed to speak with us today because she is incredibly knowledgeable and because as someone who doesn't wait for others to do the work, um, she is an inspiring example. Before I hand things over, however, I want to provide a little context for this talk as it relates very particularly to the healthcare situation in BC. Both Corinne and I are residents of British Columbia where we're facing concerning developments. A series of bills have been passed into act that are quite profoundly anti-democratic. And among these are the Health Professions and Occupations Act and the Legal Professions Act. Now the HPOA, the Health Professions and Occupations Act, serves to get rid of the right to provide and the right to receive personalized consent-based healthcare. And the LPA, the Legal Professions Act, serves to take away the right to personalize consent-based legal services, meaning the right to be represented by lawyers who are free to exercise their profession on your behalf without fear of punishment by state actors. With both of these acts, the one governing health professions and the other governing legal professions, appointed administrators will have delegated lawmaking and enforcement powers while lacking independence, lacking competence, lacking accountability. Furthermore, they'll be free from having to comply with constitution and charter, and the measures they enforce against individuals will not be subject to oversight or review by the judiciary. So to studied eyes, it appears that the purpose or function of these acts is to strip away the necessity of legitimate purpose which is essential to the functioning of the rule of law in representative democracy, the stripping away of legitimate lawmaking, and the stripping away of access to remedies for those whose rights are violated. The situation is dire, and it leads to the question, what can we do? And that question leads us directly back to Corinne because she's doing a lot. So today I'm hoping she might help us understand what has happened to the nursing profession in BC and that's a big topic. It includes what's happened to those BC nurses who chose not to be vaccinated with the mRNA COVID-19 genetic vaccines. It includes what has happened to the BC Nurses Union. And it includes what has happened to the general provision of healthcare in BC. And if Corinne can carry us through all of that, we might even get to the vital question of what we can do about all of this mess. Originally, I drew up a series of questions that I hope Corinne might answer in something like an interview format that would take us through the dramatic twists and turns suffered by BC's nurses. But then we met and talked things through and decided uh, a more fluid approach was preferable. We did, however, agree that if a set itinerary was not really what was called for or unrealistic, we'd nevertheless consider addressing a small handful of topics. And those are the first professional ethical standards, the second, employment and rights and the role of unions, uh, the third, public money and the difficulty in tracking where it goes, the fourth, the lawless behavior of the managerial or administrative state, and the fifth being the fact that we have a big problem, our cherished public institutions in the public service sector, they have laws and protections down on paper, but these laws and protections are not being enforced. 
So if the managerial state is intent on behaving lawlessly, what kind of advocacy strategies are required to bring about the needed correction? I hope that was all right, Corinne, and I'm, I'll just hand it off to you. All right, as you were talking, I think all of us need to take 10 seconds and remember where we were three years ago. Remember that viewpoint because we had no idea what was gonna be in front of us. Now I'd like you to think back to today and how much you've learned and what you know and what has been reinforced in your very being as to what your role is at this point in time in history. So we have these two perspectives. Three years ago, I was a nurse that was working in the local emergency department, uh, medical units, COVID units, home health. And I was discovering that things that were being told to us uh, via media and the government were not what I was seeing in my real life. We also were being threatened with uh, the loss of, of our employment and livelihood if we did not follow the coercion of being injected with these mandatory vaccines. And I was very lucky in that I was in a region where there was considerable um, uh, refusal to cooperate with this. So in just my local area, I was able to find 40 nurses within my very uh, close proximity that we all banded together quite quickly and made the decision um, that we would not get vaccinated. And we were only able really to have strength in this because there were a, there was a group of us. I came from a background of being self-employed. Uh, I did my nursing and graduated when I was 50 in 2015. So I was relatively new. I had been working as a nurse for about six years. So I've gone through the post-secondary education just recently. And because of my private background, I was not uh, experienced or educated about unions. All I knew was that when a nurse gets terminated, and in BC, we were terminated, we were not put on a leave of absence, we were terminated. All I knew was that, well, the union would protect us because it had already gone through recent policy changes with the province that in 2019, no nurse would ever be disciplined again for not taking a vaccination. So we knew that this was the actual decision that had been made between the government, the union and the employer. And we expected that they would abide by that. So it was a bit of, of a surprise to discover that nobody actually <laughs> follows the rules <laughs> or uh, has any intention of enforcing agreements that are put in place to protect us. So that started the path of, as we were trying to work out if we were gonna be able to go back to our jobs, it became much more complex. And um, as we started discovering some of the components that contribute to what has allowed this situation to take place in BC, the fact that the government would have the ability to remove your livelihood and your employment over uh, your refusal to take something into your body is actually quite significant. So what contributed to this? Well, what we discovered with unions, and this it took us uh, probably a year and a half to really work this out. I was able to organize about 800 nurses on a group and uh, I was the center hub for any communications and information that was coming through with their personal experiences. So I was able to be a command center in terms of seeing the communication that was coming between the government health authorities and nurses and being able to um, compile it into 
um, a, a picture of what was going on. We also were able to get legal advice that uh, helped with this process. But, but the overall picture is in BC, we have at least 40% of the workforce is unionized. And when you become a unionized member, you legally give over all representation in the workplace to the union. You no longer have the right to protect yourself in the workplace. You have no legal right. It is, it is the unions. And in Canada, we are one of the few countries that this membership is mandatory. You, uh, you cannot get the job unless you sign on the dotted line that you will become a union member. Other countries is voluntary. So what we have now is we have a system where unions have a guaranteed customer base without having to actually provide any service at all. We also have an issue in Canada where unions operate under what's called a nonprofit umbrella. This allows them the legal protection to not have to pay taxes and to not declare their financial activities in a way that um, is transparent. So you actually have now constructed the perfect entity for corruption because there is no way to see what is going on behind the covers. So we learned all this as we progressed through uh, this experience of trying to actually get our union to represent us because it was refusing to do so. It was treating us as if we were invisible. And over the course of the, of the last year, we started to notice that our provincial government was giving extremely large payouts to the union. Now, in our case, the BC Nurses Union, the role is to hold the government accountable. And what was happening is um, union dues that were being collected from nurses were running between 60 and $70 million a year. And the BC government uh, was giving over hundreds of millions of dollars to the BC Nurses Union in the guise of a, a few different categories. I'll, I'll give you a, a few examples. So um, last year, they received $100 million for nursing supports to uh, give more uh, mental health benefits to nurses. The nurses actually never received that money. And in fact, the union doesn't need to receive that money because all that had to happen was that their uh, Pacific Blue Cross benefits could have been um, increased to allow for more counseling sessions, but that money went to the union. There's a memorandum of understanding where the government agrees to give uh, this union, last year it was 200 million, this year 250 million, and then uh, every year thereafter will be 300 million under the guise of nurse patient ratios except we discovered that prior to the mandates, there were 2000 empty positions. And after the mandates, there were 5,000 empty positions. And the only way that you can enforce nurse patient ratios is if you have nurses. And somehow, even though they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars, the union uh, doesn't have a solution for providing nurses. So what we have is this is public money, taxpayer money, that the government is um, giving to the union with um, an illusion of actually solving problems. And then as this money accumulates in the union, there's no way for anyone to see where it's going, how it's being spent. So uh, we're starting to get a very good picture of, and it's not just unions, it's the whole nonprofit umbrella has been the conduit, the channel, where there has been a massive transfer of public money to these nonprofit entities. And we see this in um, all sorts of layers of governments. It's uh, usually uh, grants that you'll see. So at our local level, which is called a regional district in BC, you'll have uh, all sorts of grant money come from the provincial government that's distributed through local government and it's all handed out to nonprofit entities. And once this 
money hits the nonprofit entities, there is absolutely no requirement that the public is able to see the uh, the financial activities. It's just, again, like I said, it is the the perfect entity. If you want corruption, this is how you can do it. You the transfer of public monies to these entities is a way that our funds and resources are being leaked out of the system and diverted to entities that we cannot track. As I was uh, battling um, with the union, and of course, when you're uh, a union member, you cannot use the court system. You have to access the administrative law system, which is provided through the labor board. There's all sorts of restrictions and um, processes that are required to go through that process. And we have um, attempted accessing it a few times, but there are um, some, some blockages that they put up in the path. So I'm not gonna get into the details of that. I'm just gonna say that after three years, we are still trying to access a system that will give us uh, representation and the protection that we should have that is available to non-unionized workers through, through the law, but we as unionized cannot access. So what I've now discovered is, like I said previously, if 40% of the workers in this province are unionized and they have no way to protect themselves, it is very, it's much easier now for the government to, um, take control of any kind of action that it wants to push through in the uh, employment arena, because once it has control of the unions, the worker has no, uh, no recourse. So it has been a huge transfer of uh, power which we assumed that unionized workers actually had a more powerful, robust representation, but in fact, it has been compromised. And now we find ourselves in a place where um, there, is, there is no protection. And interestingly, I notice now with the rail uh, system that this latest uh, challenge came up where Teamsters were, we're going to go on strike. So we either have unions like ours who just take the financial payouts and don't represent the workers, or if you have unions like the Teamsters who are trying to hold the government accountable, gonna go on strike, the government just comes in and says, we're forcing you back to work and uh, we're gonna come after you if you, um, if you do pull a strike. So you're either compromised with payouts or you're disemboweled. <laughs> And either way, the role of the union uh, has now become unfunctional. And so the representation of workers has um, diminished. So we have that issue. Um, I also then started getting involved in monitoring what was going on with our um, local government. Uh, again, watching how Taxation has significantly increased in the last 10 years. The amount and the size of government that has expanded uncontrollably and the cost that is being downloaded onto the average resident now in terms of not just your property taxes, but the cost of carbon tax on all of our goods and services. And the fact that just overall, the middle class is uh, losing their asset base and there has been uh, this slow uh, transition of all of our wealth being given over to the government via these mechanisms, taxes, higher interest rates, cost of living. And we are now in a period where uh, our ability to be independent, which would be based on the fact that we do have assets, that we have resources, is all being eroded away. 
And we are entering a state where we are becoming more and more dependent on the government because of the mismanagement of how our resources have been wasted. Now, let's go back to Matthew. You want to talk about professional standards. Okay, so here we have, we have institutions where we have healthcare education. These are all things that our society has constructed to benefit us. And yet the only way that these things can really function well is if there is some kind of moral ethical standard that is uh, implemented by those who are providing these services. So the, the first step in taking out uh, healthcare professionals, which is a sector that is uh, it's foundational and we are guided by ethical standards, which would be we have to uh, respect the personal choice that any patient or client makes and that we have to support that. So that guides our interaction with the public, especially when they're in a vulnerable state, okay? So if they're uh, having a health issue or mental health crisis, whatever, the foundational principle is that we do not exert our force over someone else, that they have a right to informed consent, they have the right to make their own decisions, and that it is our job to respect that. So that's a fundamental position in order to keep the balance of power fair and equal. And so by uh, going after the healthcare professions first, what they did was they destabilized the value of ethical standards, and they punished those who were actually trying to exhibit and operate by those standards. So now the ones who took them seriously, that our ethical standards uh, could not be compromised by coercion of uh, an injection, were removed out of the system. So now you have, uh, I'm not saying that everybody that stayed in, in working does not have ethical standards, but I'm saying that a large force of that sector that did value that is no longer present in the system. So, um, Matthew, do you want to interject anything here before I keep going? Well, I, I wondered if you might say something about the protections that did exist and that were associated with the with the flu vaccine and with the struggle by uh, BC nurses and Ontario nurses because they were being uh, they were having these flu the influenza vaccines mandated and then if they refused them. Uh, they were then punished by being forced to wear masks in, I believe, Ontario and BC. And both of those uh, unions challenged this and I think went to arbitration and, and an agreement was reached. And that agreement ought to have been binding and it ought to have, it seems, provided an answer to the, the question of whether or not COVID-19 uh, genetic vaccine mandates uh, should be allowed and whether or not the uh, mask mandates should be allowed. Could you speak to that? Yeah, so the Ontario Nurses Association took on this issue first. So it used to be that there was annual influenza vaccines. And then if you didn't take that um, vaccine, then you had to wear a mask for the duration of the flu season, which usually ran from November to April. This went to arbitration in Ontario two different times, a couple of years apart. And in both, both cases, the arbitrators determined that there was no evidence to justify that the vaccines or the masks reduced transmission. And the conclusion was that this was just being used as a punitive measure to nurses if they, if they were not complying with the coercion. So this, uh, because Ontario went through two arbitrations that came out with the same decision, looking at the scientific evidence, uh, came to the conclusion that there was no benefit to this. Then the BC Nurses Union went to the Ministry of Health and the Health Employers Association of BC and said, okay, this has already been established through two arbitrators. There's no point in making us follow the same policy, which was the mask or vax 
vax or mask policy. As a result, there was an agreement that was made and a policy change in 2019 that nurses no longer had to um, get the vax, that there would be no discipline if they didn't get the vaccine, nor if they uh, didn't wear a mask. And so that was the year then that if you didn't get the vaccine, you didn't have to wear a mask and everything was fine. Then we get into this whole um, COVID era. And again, you think that, okay, the process was already enacted. So they went through the legal process of having an arbitrator decide, look at the evidence and decide. You now have agreement with all the parties that we're changing the policy and um, there's evidence to justify why we need to change the policy. And then you get to the point where when you have to enact that policy, nobody does. <laughs> so what we're discovering now in the last couple of years is that this is not an isolated incident, that there are many protections that are in place legally for us and no one is enforcing them. And so we, we now have issues running through our human rights tribunals, which are three years old because they are there are so many cases of where human rights have been violated and they can't get through them all. <laughs> And there is, again, um, all these complaints are in there because human rights were violated. So how, and you know, uh, Matthew and I were talking about this earlier and as we were kind of going through our whole discussion, we came up with kind of the final concept, but I, I am gonna bring it up here. And it's like, what happens when you start to realize that you're living in a society that does not, follow the law, where the law is a concept, but no one actually lives by it, or not no one, the average person lives by the law, but nobody else does. <laughs> it's, it's actually, we're in a, in a time right now where we have a lawless society. No, the laws are not being enforced to protect us. So then what happens to us? What what does that look like in terms of one, how do we live in this era? How do we respond? How do we bring in um, a response to this? Go ahead, Matthew. So arbitration set in place a legal framework that the union could have used to protect the nurses, the same nurses who were fired in BC could have used it was there in place, it was robust enough, and it could have protected you and all the other nurses who were fired, and it could have put an end to the, to the mandate for vaccination, and it could have dispelled the notion that there was need for masks. I mean, obviously, surgical masks aren't designed to prevent the transmission of aerosolized respiratory viruses. We know that, but it was already there in arbitration. The union could have used it, didn't use it, what did the union do instead? What did the union actually do? Because I don't think most people have any idea. We just assume the union is out there trying to help. So right when the termination started, uh, our president resigned. The vice president went on leave. The chief executive officer went on leave. Um, basically, all of the leadership of the union left the building for like four months during all the terminations. And then we found out later, uh, we actually have a recorded interview with the president that resigned. She did an interview with our legal team and um, stated that she had to leave because she was bullied. <clears throat> now, I don't know specifically who bullied her, but she she was one of the participants in this whole process of getting this policy changed around the vax or mask policy. And so she could not support mandates for nurses because 
again, this had been something that was agreed upon between the employer and the the union and the uh, for the employees. What what we discovered was basically unions have become filled with people who are uneducated, ill-equipped to mount any kind of uh, stand against the government and take on positions that pay well, but actually have no power. And, and this communication was coming out quite a bit. So in our province, what ended up happening is they fired a bunch of nurses and then the province had to transfer over into hiring a lot of travel nurses to fill in these positions. Now, interestingly enough, a travel nurse does not have to be, they're not unionized. And so what was happening was the workplace was getting full of non-unionized workers that were getting paid more than the unionized workers. And there was like no response to this. <laughs> like, can you imagine any other time in history where a union would allow a non-unionized worker into the workplace that was getting paid more than your unionized ones and just stand back and watch. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it was just another uh, characteristic of the fact that unions are, uh, they're just not, not a force. They don't have a function in our society anymore. But what they are doing is keeping the average worker from being able to get legitimate legal representation and protection, which is available to those who are not unionized. And in, in the case of, of the BC Nurses Union, you said the president resigned and a new someone new was appointed and that person is still at the helm. And how has that person responded to your attempts to negotiate? on behalf of the, the terminated nurses? So this is um, this is kind of a construction that is uh, similar even for governments. So our local government. So you, what you have is your elected officials. So in the union's case, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary in a local government, it's your um, regional directors or your town council. But then there's always the staff that are hired and they're not elected. So they're staff, they're paid staff and they are the ones who are supposed to provide continuity. However, it is the paid staff that can often lead the direction of the union or the government rather than the elected officials. So in our case, the CEO who his name was Jim Gould, he was a lawyer, he took over this CEO position, but interestingly enough, he was also the partner of the legal firm retained by the union. So he's acting as a CEO and he's acting as a partner in the firm that's benefiting from all the union business. Now, we actually put in a complaint to the Law Society because this is an example of a conflict of interest. It's one of the examples the Law Society brings up. You cannot have a lawyer work for a union if they are uh, part of the um, ownership of the legal firm like, like it's one of their examples yet when we submitted this complaint it came back to us saying uh it, to me specifically well i'm not a client of his so i can't put this complaint in <laughs> it's like what has that got to do with anything <laughs> so again there was this we were starting to see that one the healthcare and the government were not uh upholding the rules of the game then when you bring things to the law society for them to provide correction to things, uh, they were refusing to accept their responsibility and, and to uh, address what was going on. So now we have this CEO who is the only person that is doing the negotiations with the government. We know this, he's admitted that he's the only person the uh, elected board does not. And it is 
uh, his uh, presence that um, has basically affected the trajectory of what's happened with with nurses in this province. Now, interestingly enough, uh, July 26th, Bonnie Henry finally did rescind the mandates for healthcare workers almost three years after they were implemented. Um, there's two issues with this. The first one is we have been trying to get healthcare workers back to work and we are still finding that many of them are being denied being hired. So even though we were told that uh, nurses could reapply and come back to work, that is actually in practice not happening. The other part was that um, you had mentioned earlier, Matthew, about this Healthcare Professions Act that was put through legislation last November. And in that act, we saw a development now of the uh, restrictions or um, requirements for practice uh, being put into this legislation and vaccine mandates being incorporated into now a licensing issue rather than what was previously an employment issue. So in BC, when Bonnie Henry uh, put out the public health order, she never stated that healthcare workers had to be terminated. She just said we couldn't work. Who, uh, the health authorities are the ones who implemented the terminations, which was a violation of the employment contract. In BC, it was not every healthcare provider that was affected by this. It was only those that worked for the public healthcare system. So those in hospital, those who work for health authorities. Private health care could not be controlled by health authorities. And so they retained their autonomy, their independence. They were able to protect themselves. With the Healthcare Professions Act, now vaccines are attached to your license, which is different than your employment. With the rescinding of the mandates, Adrian Dix, our Minister of Health, also announced that BC was going to create and enforce a new BC immunization registry that every employee, contractor, private contractor, and volunteer would have to disclose their immunized, immunization status to this BC registry. This can be accessed of a few ways. One, if you happen to have records of your immunization status, you can submit that. If you have a positive test result that you know you had COVID, your lab result says that you've had it, you can submit that. For those who don't have records, there's only one way to check your immunization status, and that is through blood work. So what is happening now is the province of BC is compiling your personal data, which they don't have a right to, that's your medical information. And if required, they will go after your biological data. And they are now creating this net that will um, rope and strangle every single uh, healthcare professional in the province because now all of this is being tied into your license, your ability to practice in BC, whether it's under the private or the public sector. So when the, when the uh, vaccine mandates were rescinded and it was uh, also announced about this uh, registry system, it became very apparent that this was not a win. It was just another step in the government having full control over the ability for a healthcare professional to practice in this province. Could I just point out that um, you know when somebody, let's say you're an occupational therapist and you go to renew your license, then you have to agree to the conditions set out in the licensing. And if you don't agree to them, then you simply cease to be employable. And so right there, it happens very, very quickly. Uh, now, if this happens across the board with all of the public service sector, uh, certainly with all the health professions and occupations, then you would think, okay, well, this is disastrous, but 
there's still the possible possibility of remedy pursued through the courts because the judiciary is there in uh, in a in a uh, representational democracy the judiciary is there to make sure that the legislative and executive branches of government don't overstep their mandate and strip uh, rights and freedoms from those residing within the country now Clearly in Canada, what we've seen is judges are giving judicial notice and refusing, so judicial notice concerning facts uh, presented before the court. So they're refusing to hear expert witnesses testify on things relating to uh, COVID policy. That, that means they're deferring to the legislative and executive branches of government that they're supposed to oversee and correct, just as the unions are supposed to defend employees from the employer, which is in this case, the government. Now, there's still recourse to advocacy through the legal professions. And in BC, that's where the Legal Professions Act comes in. So you have a judiciary that's deferring to the administrative or managerial state which is an extension of the executive branch of government and it's not elected. They're deferring to that branch of government. And so there no oversight, no help, no remedy. And now the legal professions will be bound so that if a lawyer attempts to help, they can be severely punished. And so everybody in all the professions can be held accountable by a system that is itself lawless. And so I'm, I think this is what Corinne has referred to uh, on multiple occasions already, is that we're living in a society that appears lawless. And by that, I think what uh, she means is that some of these cherished institutions that we have um, and that, that have enshrined protections and ethical professional standards, they simply are not abiding by those and the only people who are who are expected to abide by the law are the individuals who are being crushed by these institutions' failure to adhere to the protections and laws that we've all uh, participated in creating in the first place. Sorry, a little bit long-winded. Yeah, no, that's good. And then what I'll fill in is because maybe some people aren't aware when this Healthcare Professions Act was um, activated, how we had run in this province was every healthcare profession has its own college. So you have your college of physicians, your college of nurses, your college of dentists. Each of these colleges are run by elected representation from that profession. So this is people who are elected from that group, the membership, and they can choose who they want to represent them. And it's from somebody from your own profession. What the government decided though, was it was gonna take, there were 16 colleges. It amalgamated them down to six. They removed the elected officials and they appointed government appointees now to run these colleges. And in many cases, you do not have to have anyone from your profession in those appointees, or it could be even a, a minority in terms of the, the board that's appointed. So in talking with our employment lawyer, he let me know that it is not just the healthcare professions that have had uh, the government take over their representation. It has happened to the engineers, it's happened to the trades. And now we're at the stage where they have come after the law. And so the law society responded by trying to go to court to keep themselves uh, autonomous because it's their role to hold the government accountable. How can you hold the government accountable if the government is appointing itself to oversee your profession and, and your regulation? And the government has proceeded with... Um, uh, the plan to take them over uh, until the court case has gone through, which could take a couple of years. And so they're just 
pushing forward with taking that over. So now what we have is what we termed earlier, a managerial state. So you have this illusion of functional institutions within your society that are creating and upholding the benefits that we have constructed over the last few generations. But it is an illusion because all of the direction and regulation of this has now gone been, and been transferred back to the government to implement. So there, and there's nothing now in place to hold that power accountable or to uh, bring correction if there needs to be correction. So we are now in this state where we have yet to figure out how we're going to respond to this. Very concerning. Uh, I think, you know, I've heard this referred to as the, the incremental legislation of totalitarianism uh, because it always happens bit by bit. And um, totalitarianism is a, a frightening word, but it, it, it mainly refers to an authoritarian state uh, which um, combines the interests of government and, and big industry. And so let's say we were to collapse the government bureaucracy tomorrow, but we leave in place all of the powerful lobbies that have been influencing it to do what it's done. If the future is private, as, as Mark Zuckerberg has put up in you know, the wall behind him in one of his recent speeches where he pretends remorse, um, well, well, that doesn't really help us if the same actors who have been pushing our our government sort of puppets are now put in charge of, of our society. So there's we're in this weird position of being able to identify the fact that our public sphere has been severely compromised and our institutions, um, they are being used as sort of curious purses um, filled with, with the, the tax dollar from the working class that's getting leached out of the working class and via numerous nonprofit organizations into, um, into very deep pockets indeed. Uh, and so on the one hand, we have this move to sort of push back away from these public institutions, but they're all we have. Um, without those public institutions, then we're really uh, vulnerable. But how does one fix these institutions when you have something like the Health Professions Occupations Act and Legal Professions Act and the Emergencies and Disaster Preparedness Act, they all, they're all interlocking. And one of, the, one of the key characteristics of them is that they replace, they put in, in, in top managerial positions, uh, people who are incompetent in those fields and who will offer no opposition when they are told what to do by, uh, corporate figures above them. Uh, they don't necessarily even know where the legislation is coming from that they're passing in the legislative assembly right now. And so we have this big problem across BC and across Canada, and that is we have a lot of people in uh, government positions who don't have the competence to understand the context that they're working in. And, you know, I mean, if we focus in on, on the, the nurse's case, what do you think we would have to do, how would we have to reform just the nurses union in order to get some kind of responsible action? Uh, we have to change the laws. And of course, there's a lot of backlash to this because the amount of money that is flowing through this is very powerful. But just two simple things, changing membership to being voluntary versus mandatory would immediately implement some accountability and then not allowing them to operate as a nonprofit uh, would be another. Um, another example, I'll just let you know. So the Ministry of Health in BC pays 1% of every nurse's wage to the union 
under a program called the Retiree Benefits Fund. So this agreement was made that money would be set aside to help retired nurses offset some of their costs when they're not working as much. In the last five years, $5 million has been distributed to retired nurses. In this fund is a half a billion dollars. And in the small print of this agreement, it states that this money is not guaranteed to go to nurses. So I'm just giving you that as another example of how public taxpayer money gets channeled to these entities where, you know, no one looks at the small print, but the money that, you know, it's told for its intended purpose is channeled into things that do not actually benefit those that that money was supposed to be designated to. So this is happening on every level in our government. So we are, we are losing our resources to entities of which we don't know where it's going. At the same time, we're losing our uh, participation in decisions that are happening. And I'll just jump in with another example here, but it's, it's good to, for people to have something to put this in context. So uh, just recently, our province, uh, because of the housing crisis, has decided that it's going to override uh, local government and it is dictated now that in certain populations, cities of certain populations, we need to uh, change the bylaws so that there can be more densification in, um, uh, in municipalities. So for instance, where I live, town of 10,000 people, the city council obliged, changed their bylaws so that they've automatically approved that for every residential lot in our city, it can have three and four units on it. Now, accompanied with this legislation is also that it is now illegal for there to be public hearings. So what you have now is one level of government, the provincial government, has now dictated to our local residents, our local area, that they uh, can now allow developers in to triple or quadruple the size of the population without having responsible infrastructure in place. But at the same time, it is removing the ability for the local residents, the ones who are impacted by this decision, to engage in any kind of public process where their concerns can be addressed and decisions changed we have lost our right now to participate in this process. So that is what we're starting to recognize in BC in terms of the legislation that is coming through at provincial levels. Uh, you guys have also probably noted in the Emergency and Disaster Management Act, some of the uh, loss of um, freedom we could experience in an emergency. But it is just this intentional construction of law to ensure that we no longer have the right to participate in the decisions that impact us. So besides running as an independent, which is already an enormous thing, because then you can mm -hmm. speak freely uh, within the Legislative Assembly if you, if you can get there. Um, and I think that some sometimes politicians who get thrown out of their parties have that, uh, you know, that uh, unlooked for benefit. Whereas I don't think that someone in a party can speak against their party um, within the Legislative Assembly uh, it, in these times. It looks like um, the NDP, for instance, on the Legal Professions Act appears to have voted en bloc, like all, all together, which is a curious given um, the particularly anti-democratic uh, and contentious nature of of that act. Um, are there other, I mean, it sounds like you're suggesting that one of the things that, that needs to happen is forensic auditing needs to become uh, sort of mandatory and regular for any nonprofits working together with public institutions, public, sec public service sector institutions. Um, I guess there's also we're living through a time where people want to accuse and vilify 
anyone who protests, no matter what they protest, no matter how grievous the, the offense that they're protesting, they ought not to make a fuss. But it turns out that uh, international humanitarian law does indeed protect the rights of protest and that uh, representational democracy isn't worth uh, isn't worth a, a sack of beans if if the democracies in question do not protect the right of, of citizens to dissent. The question is, what does dissent look like? What do you think dissent looks like in addition to the in considerable work you're doing running as an independent? And I've seen some of it, it's endless. The work that Corinne does is absolutely endless. Thank goodness it's not me doing that. I couldn't, I just couldn't. Um, but do you have some more thoughts on? Well, I, I'll tell you about a friend of mine, Farrell Siegel. So Farrell is a, a retired engineer in our community who has been dedicated to um, highlighting the Coots Four, those, those four Alberta men who were arrested and put into Remand Center in Alberta without real charges who have had, um, you know, court uh, delayed for 850 days. And even when uh, the last two were found to have the, the charges were um, to be dropped, they're, they're still in jail. And so Farrell goes quite often to the Lethbridge courthouse to protest. And uh, in July, he was there again, and he wrote on the sidewalk in chalk how many days these two men had been in, in jail. And as a result, he was arrested and charged because the jury had not been sequestered. And if they had happened to walk by the sidewalk, uh, it will have compromised their decision making. And so he was charged with interfering with, with the jury because the jury had not been told that these two men have been sitting in jail this whole time. So now Farrell has to go to court in September to deal with the charges of interfering with the court because he wrote this on the sidewalk. That is the level of what is what is going on. Now, I'll talk briefly about the whole independent thing. Um, I was not expecting to have to take on this role. But like I said, when I was in, in watching what was happening with legislation, seeing what was the impact that was going on in our, our local communities and finding out that we are, are losing uh, power daily, uh, it became clear to me that we need somebody in the provincial seat here that is actually going to work on behalf of our community. So I decided I'm really one of the only people I trust. So I thought, okay, I'll take this on. I have a good knowledge of what's been going on. I was initially looking at um, trying to be a candidate with the Conservative BC party. And unfortunately in my interaction with them, I, discovered that there were uh, indications that they had also already been compromised. And so as a result, I decided I was going to have to go independent, even though there's a lot of propaganda that uh, independent has no power, etc. Actually, what I'm discovering is that if you are a MLA for a party, you have no power because you don't have a say. You do not get to represent your constituents because the party is going to tell you how to vote. And in my community, I'm in communications actually with quite a few uh, conservative candidates. And it is very clear that they are not being prepared, equipped um, for the job that is going to be necessary in repairing the damage that has happened to our province because of government decisions. There seems to be this intent to keep candidates and um, MLAs uneducated so that they are easily led to make whatever decisions the party tells you. Now, somehow in our society, 
we have not developed enough that when we um, are looking at elected officials, so far the only requirement is that they're a Canadian um, resident, citizen, and to be 18 years of age. We, we haven't evolved in terms of like, have we ensured that that person can read? Do they understand financial statements? Do they have any credentials at all that would qualify them to make decisions on behalf of the rest of us? We, we have not implemented anything. And in terms of you know government employees, because we have uh, diverted from the whole concept of being hired based on merit, and now it's changed to whatever minority checkbox you can X off, our governments are full of people who are not there because of their credentials and experience. And our elected officials are not there because of their credentials and experience. And we are now experiencing the repercussions of uh, being under the authority of those who don't have qualifications or experience. <laughs> and we're paying the cost of that. And so now I'm stepping in. I've had to go independent because I'm vocal about what I know. And the, uh, the parties will not allow that. And so now I'm taking on issues. And today we just had um, an announcement in, in our province that the two main parties, the BC Liberal and the, B and the Conservative BC Party, who were going to be sort of the opposition to our NDP party, which is the party that has implemented all of these punitive policies over the last few years have now decided to join one group. The conservative movement gained power because the people were responding in uh, counteracting all of the authoritarianism that was coming from the government. The conservative party gained power because people were stepping into these seats who were representing the voice of our residents in this province who were wanting independence, wanting the government to function as a support system, not as a managerial state. And instead now, with this amalgamation of the two parties, what we're having is what I call the recycled politicians that failed in their duty the last round are now taking over all the seats of the party that potentially had power to bring correction. And now the only one that's gonna hold accountability to all of these different political politicians is us independents. <laughs> and this is getting to be uh, the, I need 10 clones to keep up with. <laughs> all of the things that are going on now. But what we are what we are seeing is this regurgitation of failed politicians crossing the floor, taking over uh, the seats of, of candidates that potentially could have brought some resistance to what's going on. And honestly, I'm still at a loss as to try to figure out, okay, what, what What's going to happen now? Because this is um, this is if you've ever watched Netflix, this is a whole co compilation of House of Cards, Narcos, <laughs> and, and uh, the season finale where we have uh, just this whole corruption of our government. With um, it's it's just big. And do I have an answer? All I know is what I can say is three years ago, all of us here right now had no idea what we were going to encounter. What I do know is that we were able to self-organize, that we have been able to bring in experts together, that we have come up with phenomenal research, analysis, contributions, networking in our communities, 
And so when I look at what has been accomplished in the last three years by a group of people who had no idea how to pull this off, I feel confident that we are amazing. And it's because of our presence in this country that we have a chance. Because if it wasn't for us, it would already be over. Speaking to something you said there about the government being full of uh, incompetence, uh, looking at recently, uh, looking at the amalgamation of the colleges, one of the one of the characteristic features of the amalgamation is that the people who are being put in charge do not have in their CVs, do not have a history of professional competence in the area they're being appointed to administer. And that is clearly by design. It's, it can't happen over and over again by accident, but it's not just there. Um, Liam, of course, it, is far better versed on these matters than, than I am, but there is uh, Harry Caton's report um, for an inquiry into the performance of the College of Dental Surgeons of British Columbia and the Health Professions Act. Uh, this is not someone, uh, he has paid a great deal of money to, to create this report that then is looked to as an authoritative document that is going to be used to guide reforms of this discipline, and he has no competence in the discipline. And then there's, there are other figures like Alan Seckel, uh, who has his hands in absolutely everything. He has his hands in absolutely everything that he does not have specific competence in. And so what it looks like, what it might look like to anybody looking uh, even a little bit closely is these appear to be something like trigger men, people, yes men, people who will say yes when uh, policy has come down to them and without looking too closely. And I've also heard, I, I, can't, um, I can't verify it, but I've also heard that within the um, BC's uh, legislative branch, that the, a good deal of the senior sort of legal secretary staff um, have been dismissed because perhaps knowing too much, you might get in the way of uh, progress if progress is defined as as the quickest way uh, to the bottom of the toilet bowl, as far as uh, rule of law, democratic governance is concerned. So this it's not like Corinne is inventing anything here. We have some really uh, shocking uh, examples of this. And, and in the case of uh, Caton and Seckel, uh, these people, they, they're having an effect, they're having an impact. <laughs> whoever they are working for it does not appear to be the public. Well, I would sort of compare it to, let's say you're in a massive car accident, head on collision, you're taken by ambulance into your nearest emergency room, you're in the trauma bay and uh, someone is brought in who knows what all the equipment is, who uh, is familiar with the room, but it's really uh, what who we have invited in to help diagnose and treat you is the housekeeper. And so that is, uh, that is the state we are in, where the housekeeper is making decisions that will determine if you survive or not. And I, my personal feeling is this election will be pivotal only because there are things that are still intended for this province in terms of things like the Land Act, uh, possible transfer of profit, property rights to First Nations. These are things that are already in play through legislation. Will we be able to recover if the wrong people are elected in this fall, our election is October 19th. It, it's hard to say. I don't, to be totally honest, I don't know that we still are in a place that we can bring correction. We're about to find that out. I do know 
that there's no way that we will bring correction unless people like you and I are going to be willing to take up positions in seats that require this kinds of leadership. What we've been doing the last three years has been spending a lot of our resources responding to decisions that have been made. And we can't continue to do this. It is, uh, It takes a lot of resources to try to stop something that has already been implemented. If we really want to have some kind of influence, we have to stop those decisions before they're made. And the only way to do that is to be in those positions that have an effect on how those decisions are made. That means that we all need to start stepping up in terms of civic participation. I have to admit, I didn't pay attention to politics at all until um, I lost my job. And then I realized the power that uh, a government can have over somebody. And the, the fight that it takes to try to uh, restore that balance, as you all know, is significant. And so in order for us to actually correct and rebuild and restabilize what we thought our society was functioning at requires effort from people who have the expertise, the commitment and the stamina to get in and take those seats back. However, we're also entering a period, this is gonna be the first time for BC that uh, like electronic ballot counting is going to be implemented. So there are so many things that are coming at us. Um, I All I know is today, I know what I need to do today to continue to bring about the possibility of change uh, I've already determined within myself, I am not responsibility, I am not responsible for the outcome of this. The way the election goes, I that's not my responsibility. But today, today I'm, you know, organizing five town halls and getting the marketing out and making my 500 signs and doing everything I possibly can today, talking to you to let you know what's really happening over here to ensure that every day, we are becoming more empowered because we're informed. And when we're informed, we can then make the choice as to what am I willing to invest in this? What am I willing to contribute? And our external influence is going to be totally dependent on what happens to us internally as individuals. So this process of of adjusting what's happening in our society can only take place as long as the internal development is also occurring because what we've already discovered is how easy it is for leaders to become corrupted. So how do, how do I ensure that I don't become one of those people that if is given power, that I don't become corrupted? The only thing I can do is make sure that my internal um, integrity system and my guidance system is operational. If I can ensure that, then I am at least worth something that the universe could use. But if I am going to be somebody that's just going to contribute to more mess, um, my role isn't my role isn't beneficial. So I take it very seriously that my internal integrity, concepts of justice, values, my network around me is um, that I'm accountable to them. I am trying to structure within my personal life the ability that I can exemplify what good leadership looks like. If I can't do that, I have no business being in a place where I'm making decisions over anyone else's bank account. So these are these are concepts that we also have to embrace that this is not just about the pressures that are happening to us externally as a society. That is there because our internal development as humans 
over the last few decades has not had enough attention. And we're starting to exhibit what happens when your internal being is not operating well, it shows on the outside. I think we're definitely experiencing a huge kind of inundation of of external uh, conditioning factors that 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 send us down avenues where ethics are sidelined. I speak with students who are off studying in pre med programs, and they talk about uh, the fact that careerism is is the dominant factor. That ethics are not even you know in in the good schools that uh, pride themselves on being le ethical leaders, that ethics are really just tossed by the wayside. There's not much uh, discussion of them. And, uh, you know, we're being conditioned to spectate rather than participate. And we're con being conditioned to spectate with things like Squid Game and The Hunger Games and we're going to watch uh, people turned against one another, and we're going to take enjoyment from their mutual brutalization, and we're not going to lift a finger. And when it comes to advocacy, we're being told, well, a good thing that Elon Musk or whoever it is, whoever is going to be the billionaire hero of the day, good thing that they're there to rescue us. Well, there's, of course, there's no one to rescue us. It's, it's just us. And... Uh, we all kind of thought that the these great institutions, and there are some wonderful institutions, the BC Civil Liberties Association has done great work, but it hasn't done a thing around COVID. It hasn't stood up for anybody. And the Council of Canadians, not a, not a jot of resistance. And so you're much better off as an individual, even feeling powerless, mounting resistance than joined to some of these institutions that... Um, purport to to be our, our our safeguards but then aren't they're stagnant pools and this is not just at the local level when we look at the un uh you've got the un does tremendous work it's theoretical work you have rapporteurs on human rights and the work they do is magnificent and the un collects this great body of international human rights law and if we dissolve the un that would be a great tragedy for the world because we'd lose that and yet you have all of those brilliant minds who were taken out of their own countries where they were doing magnificent work and where they would have continued to do magnificent work that would have had a direct impact on conditions in their country. And they're brought into onto a global platform where everything they do has no impact, cannot have an impact. So the UN actually functions as an interesting corral for the brightest lights to make sure that their contributions remain at the theoretical level so what we want is even if we're <laughs> even if we're not particularly significant on our own perhaps we need to to lose the idea that iron man tony stark is going to save us you know it's like you know we're probably nobody and even ourselves we're not going to save ourselves but we we might as well suffer as well as we can maybe Um, it's an it's an interesting tension, right? Because um, there has been this slow permeation of this idea that the government acts in our best interests. We get free health care, you know, we have uh, EI, we have pension, and the the government actually, you know, wants to help us. And so you you have this, Again, this illusion that this powerful entity is benevolent towards you. And then you start to get to know this entity and you start to understand that actually, no, it's um, it has become a greedy organism where it just wants to get bigger and bigger and all the resources it takes to feed itself rather than to provide nutrients for you. And then it gets so big, it's like, how do you stop its power and its control? And this is 
this is the stage that we're at. We, we understand that this entity has gotten too big for itself. And we are not dealing with um, intelligence. We're just dealing with power. And so then the actual effects of that organism are it creates hardship for us and distress. And that is increasing at levels that are very quick and it's hard for us to process and hard for us to respond. And in many cases, you know, we just shut down because it's too big for us to try to find a solution. But in the big picture, I think that's what the whole purpose of this season is about. It's about trying to teach to us how we have to come back and embrace our personal power, our personal responsibility, our personal participation in the, the function of this organism. And this is uncomfortable. And many of us, I'll admit, uh, you know, I was just focused on making money. And, you know, I got to the stage in life where I'd raised my kids, I could move on, I just wanted to go travel, see the world, I wasn't thinking responsibility. But here we are, apparently, it's our gen, like my generation, that is the only ones that are aware that it is not normal for people to think that they will never be able to afford a house. It is not normal that you should not be able, that you can't access a doctor. It's not normal that your emergency room is closed. We know this. My kid's generation doesn't know this. They think this is normal. So it has become our responsibility, the older age group, to be able to um, use our voices and our influence to say, hold it, you know, what's going on is not normal and there's something wrong. And so how do we, uh, how do we actually live in a system where we are benefiting from this relationship instead of it create, it's being intentionally created that, uh, People are going to oppose each other and uh, eventually there will be a fight on to who's going to get the resources and who's not. I mean, that's going to be the long-term effect of this.